on the body of a Christian, so we curse it when it touches us in the name of Jesus. But this year, in the year of Reformation, we started last week on a, a series called Reformation of Our Faith. And we attacked a reality, and that is that many people are seeking the hand of Jesus, but not the face of Jesus. Many people's, many people's faith was formed properly. They accepted Christ as their Savior. They genuinely loved God. They were genuinely changed by Christ. But over time, they stopped looking to Christ as the Savior, and they started looking at their salvation more in what God is going to be able to do for them. I want to remind you that God never said that we are to love what he does. We are to love him. Amen. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, your body, soul, and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love what God does for you. I love that God does. I love that God saves. I love that God heals. I love that God delivers. I love that God moves in our lives. I love all of that. But that is not why I serve him. I serve him because of who he is. And last week, when we started talking about the deformation or how our faith has been deformed, was how many people's faith is built upon what God has done or they want him to do, and their faith is in that rather than in who God is. I can't tell you, after 37 years of ministry, how many people I have watched walk away from God because they didn't get their prayer answered. They got mad at God, a problem happened, they called out to God, and there was no answer. God did not perform what they desired. So therefore, they said, well, then God is not real. I don't want him. I'm walking away. And they walked away from their, from, their, from their relationship with the living God. To me, that is absolutely sad. But what it shows is their faith had been deformed into seeking what he does rather than who he is. We talked about Job, how God, man, uh, the enemy came and decimated everything of Job. He was even scraping the boils with rocks and dogs were licking them. And his wife looked at him and said, curse God and die. But Job said, though he slay me, yet shall I serve him. His relationship was not on all the blessings that God had given him, but his relationship was built upon who God was. Now his wife was based on what was produced. His wife did not have that relationship. That's why she told him to curse God and die. So I'm here to tell us, as our faith is maturating, as we're growing in our relationship with the Lord, we have got to make sure that our faith is not deformed, but that our faith is in the original intent of our Savior. Today I want to talk about this. I was asking the Lord, what would you want to tell your family about how to live by faith? So if our faith is to be formed properly, we have a Messiah, we have a Savior who showed us not in word only, but also in deed. And as Christ unfolded, as he walked on this planet, how to live by faith, how to believe in faith, how to, how to engage God in faith, it was amazing to realize that Jesus got great answers. Now, I love the fact that every person that Jesus prayed for was healed. And I believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So why are we not seeing more of the healing and the miracles? Not that, you know, I thank God in this church, we see healing and miracles all the time. And we prayed this morning for a miracle. I believe God did that. Say amen. amen. So here we are, we believe in miracles, but why are there not more? Why are we not seeing more of God's power? Some people would say, well, it's a different time. No, no, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're in the same age, church age is called, from the day of Acts, when it opened up in Acts 2, until the rapture of the church. So we're still in the same essence, so why? And when we look at Jesus, there's something so evident, and that is that Jesus' miracles that he produced the faith that he lived was not based on his miraculous power or even his words, but it was based specifically on his relationship with God. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 is our verse for the day. And it says this, and Jesus, oh, I just got to read it. So here we go. Ready? Then Jesus said, who said? Jesus. Who said? Jesus. Jesus said. So Jesus, the son of God, the one who rose from the dead is speaking to us specifically. He's saying, listen, I'm going to teach you something. 
Listen, I want you to pay attention to this. Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. Now, it didn't say have faith in faith. It didn't say have faith in prayer. It didn't say have faith in a church. It didn't say have faith in some optimal mindset that I seem to have. We call it mental ascent. He said have faith in God. We're talking the personage of God, that God is alive, that God is real, that God is supernatural. Jesus said, have faith in God. So what is faith? Faith is so important. And the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Somebody came up to me and said one time, are you one of those hyper faith preachers? And I said, well, absolutely. They meant it as, a, as, a, as, as a, a, a breaking down or saying something negative to me. I says, well, of course I'm a hyper-faith preacher. I said, the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So if I'm going to please God, I want to have all the faith that I can get. Yes. So here Jesus is saying, have faith in God. Well, here we're, we're hearing Christ break down so simple in just a few words how he could move in the power that he did, how and why he did what he did, and it was because he had faith in God. He knew God. This is something that is many times very foreign. As we were watching on the TV, the other, on the YouTube the other day, it was foreign. One lady actually says, well, we don't believe the whole Bible. Well, we, we, we believe Jesus gave a lot of metaphors. And I'm sitting there and, you know, you want to reach through the TV and do that little shake. But the problem is, is that's not just in that type of church. It's also in the body of Christ, even here, where many people have started off with a pure faith, a genuine faith. But then they were deformed because they desired God to do something and they stopped having faith in God because they didn't get the answer that they wanted. I want to remind you that when Abraham, God gave him a promise that he would have a child, a man child, to carry on the legacy and the lineage that was therefore going to be the promise that it was 20 years before between the prophecy and before the manifestation. Can you imagine, and it talks about it in the book of Romans chapter 4, that, that he did not stop believing, that he did not give up. Why? Because he knew God. I'm here to tell you today, there is a key to your faith. The key to your faith is not the right chant. It's not the right words. It's not dancing in three circles one way, spinning around twice in the other. It is knowing God. And the church has to get back to not knowing about God, but knowing God. Knowing his name, but not his name only, but knowing his personage, knowing his personality, knowing his likes and dislikes. Listen, in the old covenant, they didn't have this privilege. Only the priests, uh, the, the, the kings, prophets, and priests had the ability to do that. But when Jesus died on that old rugged cross, the Bible says that the temple veil was ripped in two. It opened the Holy of Holies. And now, according to Hebrews chapter 4, we have the right to come into the throne of God boldly. Why? Because we are now sons and daughters, those who've called upon the name of the Lord. They shall be saved. And when he saved us, he changed us. And now the relationship with God is available to us. Us. We are in the greatest posture position that we could ever have, yet many have abandoned that because they wanted God to live by their rules rather than living by God's rules. They wanted God's relationship according to their, come on now, their lineup rather than saying, God, you are God and I am not. You see, one thing that you get to know when you get to know God is that God is the most loving, caring person that you could ever meet. He is truly genuine. He loves you with an everlasting love. It is an uncompromising love. Listen, you, God will not love you more today than he did when you were lost in trespasses and sin. It is unconditional with God. 
And when you know that, the acceptance from the Lord is so easy because you recognize, and even learning how to forgive yourself is so easy because you learn that if God can forgive you who knows your end from your beginning, God can forgive you who is a righteous and holy and just God. If God can forgive you, then you can forgive yourself. You see, by knowing him, you can have faith towards yourself. But if you just try to have faith towards someone you don't know, then there's a problem because when you don't know somebody, you can't trust truly trust somebody. So have faith in God. Well, what's faith? Faith is important. You know, I see my little foamy thing here. Does it go on the nose? No, it does not. We'll take the foamy thing and put it there. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this. So you got to understand what faith is. How can you have something you don't know what it is? Can I tell you what faith is not? Faith is not, I believe it when I see it. Faith is not, God do it my way or hit the highway. Faith is knowing God, but then it says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. The conviction of the reality faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. So faith is what you start hoping for is the launch pad for faith. I want you to hear me now. When you don't know God, praying by faith is hard. Can't tell you how many preachers I've heard. Oh, Lord, (laughs) I beseech you in the name of God the Father. That Lord, mighty, 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 mighty God. Oh, sovereign Lord. If it be thy will. (laughs) We ask that you'll answer my prayer. Do you know what you're going to get from that prayer? Nothing. Why? Because that's hope. Hope is different from faith. Hope is the aim. Faith is the activator. You cannot retrieve from heaven to earth with hope. And so what happens is when you only pray in hope, then you always live in a question mark of whether or not it's God's will. First John chapter five, verse 14 and 15 says this. And this is the confidence, the confidence, the faith that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to his will and we know his will because we know him and we know him by his The more you know God, the more you have confidence that when you start talking to him, it's not just your words are dissipating into the air and penetrating the the, uh, vaulted ceiling, but that you are truly talking to the king of kings. You have entered into the throne room of God boldly, and now you're standing. You can't see yourself there in the essence of literally physically being there, but in the spirit, you are standing before the God who said, let there be, and there was, and God is saying, that's my child. That's my kid. Ah, he knows me. She knows me. Now listen. Come on now. Let me listen to my son. Let me listen to my daughter. Are they talking my will? Are they talking my desires? Are they talking my heart? Are they talking my passions? And when you start releasing that prayer, all of a sudden God goes, they know me. They believe me. Here it goes. And it comes from heaven to earth. You see, that's the powerful part about that verse. True faith is that even before you see it manifest in your physical hands, it is already physically manifested through the word of God. Until you have it in your hand, you have the word as your assurance, your title deed. You can grab your Bible and declare, I knew one man of God who got sick and the doctor saw, I forget how many, how many blood clots he had in his lungs. And he had just left a ministry, was on his way home and he felt hard to breathe and he was all by himself. And he went into this hospital and they, they said to him, sir, we don't think you're going to make it. You have this many blood clots in your lungs. Usually this will kill somebody. And he said he laid in the eye 
ICU. He, he couldn't even reach his wife. And he had his Bible and he placed it across his chest. And he said, God, this is my title deed. God, this is where you have said that you are my healer. You are Jehovah Rapha, the God that healeth thee. And he laid it across his chest and God healed his body. I'm here to tell you that as a believer, we have got to get back to believing as Jesus did. And our faith, our confidence, our trusting, our knowing is only upon the knowing. Amen. You got to know him. And a lot of people have a concept of God. You know, what's really interesting. And I'd love to do this and we should is get a TV camera Go out to the street and say to people, who is Jesus to you? Now, I've watched that done. It is amazing how many philosophies are out there. Can you imagine doing that in your, in your own church? I can. I can imagine there'd be a lot of philosophies even in our church. Well, I believe Jesus is this. I believe Jesus is that. I believe God is this. I believe God. Listen, now. it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters who he is. You see, because you can perceive incorrectly and never receive what God has planned for you to be promised through the word of God. But when you know God, then you have a surety. When you know who God is, not only in relationship of you praying and talking with him and knowing him, not just knowing about him, but all of a sudden you pick up the word and through revelation of the Holy Spirit, he starts saying, this is who I am. This is what I promise. This is what I do. It's not that you trust him because he said that. You trust him because you know him and he said that. Because if you can't trust somebody, no matter what they say, it doesn't matter. You don't believe it's really going to happen. And there are a lot of folks that just don't believe what God says is going to happen. And they don't, not because they're not good folk, not because they're not even not going to heaven, but because they don't truly know God. The one thing about the faith of Jesus was that you knew he knew his father. Well, he was God. That's why he knew him. No, you need to grasp this. Jesus came, was born of a virgin. He grew up in a family. We don't know how much he knew. We do know this, that at the age of 12, he was in, in the temple and he was teaching and, and learning and growing. He was growing in his faith. And we know that he said, I must be about my father's business. And he was talking about his heavenly father. So at that point, we know he had some concept of who he was. And then we don't hear anything until he's in his 30s. But in that, he grew in knowledge. He grew in love with his father. He had a relationship with God. And I want to remind you, he did no mighty miracles until he was baptized in water and the spirit of God came upon him. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, he dwells inside of you. And you and I can know him. We can walk like Christ. We can be like Christ. And we can know our father in heaven, Abba, Father, like Christ knew Abba, Father. How do we know that? John chapter 15. He says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. Yes. As a believer, if we're going to have the faith that Christ had, we're going to have the true form of faith that was executed by Jesus on the planet. We have got to get to know God. Here's a powerful verse found in John 18, excuse me, John 8 verse 19. And it says this. Then they said to Jesus, we're talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the religious folk of those days. These guys, they said the right words. They did the right things. They wore the right garments. They were who people went to to learn from religion. But they came to Jesus and they said something to him that was so profound. And it was this. And they said to Jesus... Where is this father of yours? And Jesus answered, You know my father as little as you know me. Well, well, well. For if you knew me, you would know my father also. 
It doesn't matter how many years you've been in church. It doesn't matter how religious you are. What matters is do you know God? Do you have a relationship with God? Are you in a relationship with the one who saved you from your sins or do you just want to get out of hell? When was the last time you prayed? And, and not because you're in trouble. Come on. When was the last time you opened your Bible? Well, you know, I don't like to read. Well, guess what? If I offered you $100 more an hour, if you read this book, you would read that book. But you find more value in something that's temporary than something that's an eternal. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and we know that as you read the word of God, God reveals himself by his spirit, that the anointing that's on the word of God, for the letter of the law killeth, but the spirit giveth life, that all of a sudden life starts coming to you. And all of a sudden revelation starts coming to you. And God starts revealing his nature. God starts revealing his love. God starts revealing his, his compassion. And God says, listen now, I am my hand is not short. Man, some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but I will trust in the name of the Lord my God that you can learn and to stand. And after you've done all you can do to stand, you can stand in the power of his might because you know him. So many believers in church today have not been pushed to know God. They've been pushed to get out of hell. And that's good. You want, don't want to go there, man. It's bad. It's bad to go to hell. And that's just a nice place. Oh, we'll remind you that hell, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, will be regurgitated and all those people will be going before the white throne judgment of God. And because their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they'll be cast into the lake of fire. And from that point on, that's the rest of their eternity. That's bad. But if that's the only reason you got saved, then you missed the whole thing. God sent Jesus not to build another religion like the Pharisees and Sadducees, but to build a family yes, amen. and to know him. And Jesus showed that so clearly through his scripture. Man, we, we look at all the miracles and we only look at miracles, but that's not, what, that's not the key. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to go back to that verse, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, you may be lifted up, thrown to the sea, and it will happen. But you really must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. The no doubt in your heart has to do with your relationship with God. If, you borrow, if someone borrowed money from you and they said they were going to pay you back and they shook your hand, and they didn't pay you back, but it was only a few bucks. They came back the next time and they need a grand. You're less likely to lend them the thousand dollars because you couldn't trust them to return the 10. Here we are as believers and we've got to recognize as the scripture is saying, listen, you're going to doubt God if you don't believe God. If you don't know God, you can't believe him. The church has to press back in. Not for faith and faith, but for faith in God. And you can't have faith in someone you don't know. And so many folks are just sitting back in church. Man, you, you've done God a favor by coming today, right? Now how it works? Well, I, get, I did God a favor. I came to church today. Really? You impressed God by coming to church? Man, you're missing it. You're missing the whole thing here. What made Jesus great was his relationship with the Father. What made Jesus do great things was his relationship with the Father. Jesus said it this way, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So everything that Jesus did that was good, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 10 makes that declaration, 
And Jesus did good, healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I'm here to tell you that if you see what Jesus did, you know your father did. Because Jesus only did what the father did. And when the father did it through his son Jesus, he was showing his love, his compassion, his reality, his personage, his personality, his character, his nature. And you and I as believers, no man, we got to say, God, I've got to get to know you. I've got to have this confidence that when I pray according to your will, you'll hear me and the the answer will be on the way. God, I don't want to lay hands on somebody and wonder if it's going to happen. I want to lay hands on somebody and know it's going to happen. God, when I cast out a devil, I don't want them to look at me and say, do you really believe? Nah, they know I believe. They know I have authority. They know I have power. And as a believer, we're going to make a difference on this planet rather than suck air and go home. Amen. If you're here just to suck air and go home, baby, go home. But you and I are here to do God's bid, amen. God's business. Say amen. amen. I'm going to prove it to you. Verse 24 of Mark 11. Sorry, I'm teaching today, not as much preaching. Okay. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe yes. that you received, yes. it will be yours. Yes. Woo! Yes. I said that mockingly. Watch now, because I want to read the last verse. Verse 25, but when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will also forgive your sins. Watch, you know what he just, Jesus just did? He said, listen, you want something? Ha, my God, pray it in the name of Jesus. I'll show, bring forth a manifestation. Oh, but before you, before you like go that far, I want you to, I want you to say, do, do you have unforgiveness in your heart for anybody? Because it's about relationship. Touching God is about relationship. Touching God is not about the right quoted words. Amen. Do you know God? Do you remember when Jesus was in the boat? God told him, go to the other side. How do I know that? Because Jesus only did what the Father told him to do. Him and his disciples jump in the boat. They're crossing over. This is found in the book of Mark chapter 4, verse 38 through 40. Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a, on a, on a cushion. Isn't that cool? Jesus had his own pillow. <laughs> the disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And he asked them, watch now, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Watch now. How could Christ, the waves were real. The storm was valid. It was not something made up. It was so intense that even the professionals were afraid they were going to die. But here Jesus is asleep in the boat on a pillow. How could Christ be asleep on the pillow during a, a storm that was so intense that it scared the professionals. A lot of us trials come in our life that are real and we're not sleeping in the boat. We're grabbing a bucket and trying to bail it out. We don't look to God. We look to our own strength, our own ingenuity. Come on now, when you got a plan B, you've abandoned plan A. Because you don't believe plan A would happen if you've created a plan B. Mm, my Lord, my, 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 my. God told him, go to the other side. Do you want to know why Jesus could sleep in the boat? Because he knew God. And if God said, go to the other side, he was going to go to the other side. What was the difference between Jesus and the disciples? They didn't really know God. <laughs> because when you have faith in God, you are going to be able to float if you've got to float. I'm here to tell you today that as believers, we have to have our faith reformed. And the reformation of our faith is not that we're believing in the right... <laughs> Listen now, you got to know this. If you listen, there are a lot of preachers when they're praying for somebody will say the exact same words. It's almost like the magic words. 
Ain't no magic words. Do you realize that those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved? Some people say, well, you got to do the salvation prayer. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, forgive me, forgive me. And you can go through the whole, you know what? If you don't do that with a desire to know God, then that prayer means absolutely nothing. But the word of God says those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're in a position and all of a sudden say, God! And he goes, yep, there I am. I heard them. It's activated by faith. By grace are you saved through faith. Not by works, and works can even be a prayer. It's knowing God. If God died today, would you have to wait till next week to find out? We are people that God is calling to have our faith reformed because let's be honest, (laughs) we're going to make it by faith, but we're not going to make it if we don't have faith. The Bible says in 1 John that we will overcome the world even by our faith. But not faith in faith, our faith in God. That no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That if they come against you seven ways, they're going to have, if they come against you one way, they're going to have to leave seven ways. That greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. These cannot be cliches. You've got to know the God of those statements. And when you know the God of those statements, then you know all of heaven is standing behind you. And you can't fail because you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a difference. Do you remember when Lazarus died? In John chapter 11. John chapter 11, Lazarus died and Jesus went and he went to go raise him from the dead. And this is what happened in in verse 41. So they rolled the stone away. Then Jesus looked up to heaven. Listen, 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 listen. You got to hear this prayer. This is stinking cool prayer. You ready? Father, thank you for hearing me. Watch this. You always hear me. But I said it out loud for the sakes of the people around me. (laughs) The only reason Jesus prayed out loud was to build other people's faith. Because he knew every time he prayed, the Father heard him. See, when you know him, it changes everything. But when you just know about him, the circumstances Change his character to you. We've got to know God. You want faith that's not deformed? You've got to know God. That means you've got to pray. I should say it this way. You get to pray. You get to read the word of God. You get to come to church. Well, you know, I don't think we need church. Really? Then why did Jesus create it? Jesus is not a moron. Jesus created the church because he knew that we need each other to build each other up, encourage one another, strengthen one another. He knew that, come on now, there's power in groups called synergy. He knows that one shall put a thousand to flight and two shall put 10,000. I'm telling you right now, if you're going to grow in God, you're going to grow in Christ. The one thing you've got to know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you've got to know him. I didn't say get an inkling of him. I didn't say get out of hell card. I said, you've got to know him. You've got to spend time with him. You got to chat with him. You've got to be around him. You've got to be around people that know him. You've got to be around people that will share with you. You've got to know, you've got to know the God of creation. You've got to know the God of your salvation. And when you know him, there is a faith that cannot be distorted. Come on now. Or deformed. When you pray, you know, because you know him. And when you know him, everything shifts. You want faith that's going to make it? You want faith that's going to get your answers? You got to know him. The day your faith is determined by your answer 
You've stopped chasing him and you've started chasing his answers. And you'll be thoroughly disappointed because God is not activated. Heaven is not released by philosophy. Heaven is only released through faith that is established in relationship. And the more you know him, the more you'll be like him. Amen. 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 Bow your heads with me this morning. Little prayer means little faith. Little word means no faith. No faith means you can't please God. No answers produces hopelessness and a lack of trust. Hopelessness and a lack of trust create a lack of relationship. And this is eternal life, that you may know the Father and the Son whom he has sent. Today, if you don't know Jesus, you can't join this church, you can't join religion, but God has opened the curtains so that you could know him. No greater honor than knowing God. I didn't say as an acquaintance. I said as a child, a son and daughter, a citizen. I don't care how many years you've been going to this church or any church. I know people have been born again 40 years that are still going to hell in a handbasket. Why? They don't know God. They have a concept of God. They have the fire suit that, from God to get them out of hell, but it's not because God's stimulated by relationship, by faith. Today, if you're not right with the Lord, I'm not asking you to, I'm not asking you to do anything weird. I'm asking you to want him bad enough that it doesn't matter what anybody thinks or says. I want God. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. Today, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I ask that you check your heart. Please don't lie. The devil's not the greater deceiver. We deceive ourselves far quicker than the devil does. Ask yourself a simple question. Do I know God? If I asked you to write down who is God to you on a piece of paper, would you only be able to write the cliff notes or would you actually know him? If you would like to receive Jesus as your savior, you want to get right with God, I'd like you to slide your hand up right now. Is there anyone? Thank you very much. Put your hands right back down. I see them. Is there anyone else this morning? Thank you very much over on that side. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? I'm not going to wait long. Because I figure if I got to beg, you don't want to know him anyways. <laughs> you ever had somebody come up and they want to they be your friend so bad that they're always there. They even break face space. <laughs> they, if, 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 if you got to do that, they don't really want to be your friend. So you got to beg someone to get saved. They don't really want to be the friend of God. I'm going to ask one more time. Anybody here want to get right with Jesus? Besides those who have already raised their hands. Five, come on, get your hand up. Four, three, thank you very much. Two, come on, last call. And one. Let's all stand to our feet this morning. I'm so thankful that you decided to be here today. I pray that this word challenged you. If you're watching online and you want to give your heart to Jesus, I'd like you to do one of two things. Number one, I want you to dial 833-459-5785. It's right, on, right on, the, uh, on, the, on the screen right now. Or just go to histabernacle.com and push the button about salvation. We'll make sure somebody gets right a hold of you. But if today you raise your hand for salvation, I'd like you to be brave. If everyone will turn to the person to the right or the left and say, if you raise your hand and, and, and you want me to go up with you, I'll go with you. Come on now. 
Pastor Craig, you want to ask your wife? You, know, you want to ask? Amen. You guys don't know. No one really knows. Amen. If you raise your hand, can you meet me down front right now real quick? Now remember, you're not joining a church. You're not joining a church. You're not joining religion. You're asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And today, God's going to change you. You don't even need to jump through hoops. He loves you exactly how you are. Now he's going to start changing from the inside. I want to pray together. Will you pray out loud with me? Awesome. Pray right out loud. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I don't even understand everything that's going on. But there's one thing I know for sure. I want you in my life. I surrender my heart to you. Forgive me of my sin. Make me a new person from this day forward. I'm never going back to the world. I'm going to run to you. I'm going to know you. And I'm going to love you. In Jesus' name. Do me a favor, you can make your way right over to Mo and T. I want to make sure you guys got Bibles and they're all set. Amen. I'm going to have the prayer team come to the front of the altar right now. If you need prayer for anything, maybe you need healing in your body, God will heal your body. God loves to heal. It's his nature. I am Jehovah Rapha, he said. If you're struggling with diff different temptations or struggles in any manner, I want you to know, or even, a, even an addiction, God wants to set you free and free indeed. This prayer team know how to pray or I wouldn't allow them up here. They're people of faith or I wouldn't allow them up here. So when they pray for you, you can know that the one shall put a thousand, two shall put ten thousand, and the prayer of agreement will be released and your answer will be on the way. Amen. I love you. Serve God with all of your heart. Make sure you fill your road next week. Enjoy Jesus. Enjoy his relationship.